worse was the role played by one of the most important notables of Adana, Abdul Qadir Baghdadi Zadeh, and his faction in the, mass, in, the, in the massacres. This UP representative in Adana, Ihsan Fikri, played a dominant role in shaping public opinion and trans transforming verbal into physical violence through, through his newspaper, Itidal. The reaction of the central government and the CUP against the real culprits of the massacres was extremely lenient as was attested in the decisions of the courts martial. And the reaction to Adana itself is a, is, a, is, a, is a very long and large topic and a complex topic specifically dealing with the investigation commissions that were sent to Adana, the local courts, courts martial, the war tribunals, etc. So it's, it's, it's a larger topic. Uh, it seems that the CUP, having just recovered from a huge blow as a result of the counter-revolution, was afraid to take drastic action against the real culprits of the massacres because it was afraid that this would have wider effects in the region and would endanger its existence. The Adana massacres not only resulted in huge Armenian losses, amounting above 20, I'm done, 20, uh, uh, 20, was it 20 minutes? Above 20,000, actually, uh, but also led to the destruction of one of the most important economic centers in Anatolia. Thank you very much. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Luan Matosian, who will speak uh, on Missionary Witness, the Christie Family Papers on the Cilician Massacres of 1909. Yes. Or should I just sort of... I didn't grab my uh, cheat sheet. Or should I just tell you? It's tough. All right. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, it certainly is a pleasure to see so many friends and colleagues here today. I'm very grateful to NASA for this invitation. Thank you. The story of the Adana massacre, the killing and pillaging and burning, the desperate street fighting which lasted two days, the plight of the missionaries shut up in the girls' school building, the martyrdom of Mr. Rogers, the heroic work of Major Dowdy Wiley and his noble wife, the scenes at government headquarters of which Mr. Lawson Chambers and I were witnesses, and the pitiful plight of the refugees in Adana after the massacres, all these events, as enumerated just now by missionary witness Herbert Adams Gibbons, are documented in a remarkable, scarcely known archive at the Minnesota Historical Society. The Thomas and Carmelite Christie papers document the lives of a family of Protestant missionaries from Minnesota who served in Marash and Tarsus from 1877 to 1920. Thomas, a veteran of the Civil War, was educated at Beloit College and ordained soon after his graduation from Andover Seminary. Sarah Carmelite Brewer, a graduate of Rockford Seminary, taught school until her marriage and departure for Marash, where five of the seven Christie children were born. Spanning the years 1804 to 1977, the Christie family papers comprise 43 archival boxes of correspondence, printed material, newspaper clippings, transcripts, school catalogs, photographs, and bound volumes. The latter include diaries, notebooks, guest and address books, account and record books, and three published books, 73 volumes in all. A finding aid at the Minnesota Historical Society, and you have the URL right there, right fast. <laughs> 
gives a sense of the scope of this collection. It says, the correspondence and diaries contain frequent discussions of missionary and Turkish lifestyles, particularly of Armenian and Muslim women, epidemics and famine, administration of and fundraising for St. Paul's Institute, teaching experiences of Carmelite and daughter Mary at the Institute among Native women, and relations with the Turkish government. Family letters, essays, and diaries by Carmelite and Mary detail the sufferings of the Armenian people during the massacres of 1895, 1909, and 1915, and the missionaries' efforts to give them refuge and relief. In 1893, after 16 years of missionary work in Marash, the family moved to Tarsus, where Thomas assumed the presidency of St. Paul's Collegiate Institute, a privately funded preparatory school for boys. Carmelite was actively involved in the administration of this school, especially during her husband's frequent fundraising trips and visits to outlying mission stations. Such was the case during the Young Turk Revolution in the summer of 1908. What will you say when you get home to finding the political changes you will hear of en route, wrote Carmelite to Thomas on August 9th. Liberty, equality, and fraternity, watchwords everywhere, and demonstrations galore. A brotherhood, the members wearing badges, made up of any and all races. Turks and Armenians in particular pledge to loyalty to country and one another without regard to race or religion. Turks feasting Armenians, and Armenians, Turks. Free dinners to the poor, special trains to Adana for a demonstration. All mere seen in a tumult of joy, in Tarsus marching crowds, police at the head of Turks and Armenians shouting, long live liberty, long live the army, etc. The army has done this. <coughs> Freedom to go anywhere. Our Teskere is not looked at here or in Mersin, people going and coming as freely as in America, bribery punished by loss of office. It's too good to last, and one fears a reaction. It's hard to understand. The Turks are making more fuss than the Armenians over it. I fear the people are not ready for liberty, and unless carefully handled, there may be license that will result in party feeling and quarrels, etc. All is excitement and rejoicing just now. England is said to be behind the movement. Political prisoners have all been liberated. One rubs his eyes and asks, how can all these things be? The deaths of two American missionaries during the first Adana massacre are briefly noted in the diplomatic correspondence of the British consul at Mersin, Major Dowdy Wiley. In the Christie papers, the tragedy unfolds in almost cinematic detail. Daniel Minor Rogers, 27, of Tarsus, and Henry Maurer, 35, a Mennonite missionary from Hajin, were trying to save the Adana Girls School from the general conflagration in the city. Minor's account breaks off in mid-sentence, seemingly interrupted. His good friend Stephen Trowbridge and father-in-law Thomas Christie take up the narrative. Thursday morning, the conflagration had increased and spread so that we were obliged to watch closely the environs of the girls' school building and of the chamber's residence, Tarbidge wrote. All streets were deserted, firing from the ambuscades being kept up all the morning. A fresh outburst of smoke and flame very near to the girls' school on the north showed that a new conflagration threatened us. The wind fanned the fire and drove it along from house to house. <coughs> 